Dr. Baliga here. This podcast is on statistics in medicine. It's from an outstanding chapter in Baliga's textbook of internal medicine. It's authored by Dr. Donna Windish, MD, MPH, who is the Associate Professor of Medicine at the Department of Internal Medicine at Yale University School of Medicine. She is the Associate Program Director for the Yale Primary Care Internal Medicine Residency Program. She completed her medical school degree at the University of Connecticut and her internship and residency at, in New York at the University of Rochester. She went on to do a fellowship in general internal medicine at Johns Hopkins University School of Medicine and obtained her MPH at the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health. Dr. Windish has been on faculty at Yale since finishing her fellowship. She's clinically active in both inpatient and outpatient medicine. She oversees research and residency program at the Yale Primary Care Training Program and teaches medical students at residence biostatistics and how to read medical literature. This long podcast is a, pod, is a capstone podcast from the previous 10 podcasts on multiple choice questions in st- medical statistics. Statistical overview. Statistics is the scientific use of data to describe and draw inferences about true associations by assessing the strength of evidence for or against a hypothesis. Statistics and and studies are used to make predictions and comparisons about a larger population based on data collected from a smaller sample. Statistics relies on sample data to guide our understanding of the truth. How well the sample represents the larger population determines how generalizable the findings are. Population types. There are three populations from which data are derived and inferences made. The target population, the study population and the sample population. The target population is a specific population for which a measurement or attribute is sought. It includes everyone in the world who possesses the characteristics of interest. Since it's impossible to study everyone, researchers conduct a study with a smaller number of subjects. Study population. This is a group of individuals who can easily be identified and who possess all or some of the characteristics of the target population. This population is used to assess generalizability of a study. The more closely the study population resembles the target population, the more generalizable the results are to that target population. Sample population. The sample population is a subset of the study population. It is from this population that the data are actually collected. We use statistical tests on the sample population to make inferences about the target population. Study outcomes, primary outcome and secondary outcome. Primary outcome, this is the main outcome of interest in a study. It can be the end point of the study or another specific event. The primary outcome determines how many people are needed in the study to see a difference in outcome between study groups. That is how the study is powered. Secondary outcome. These are additional outcomes measured during the course of a study. The key point regarding outcomes. Since a study is not specifically powered to look for secondary outcomes, the strength of the evidence may not be sufficient to make conclusions about these outcomes. Hypothesis testing. This is an approach that helps to make a decision about the results. Hypothesis testing requires A. A statement of the null hypothesis B. Threshold for declaring p-value to be significant Typically, the p-value number is less than 0.05 and C. Decision to determine if the p-value obtained is statistically and clinically significant. 
null hypothesis the null hypothesis is a statement of no effect or no association for example stating study participants and controls do not differ in the mean blood pressure after the intervention one rejects or accepts a null hypothesis based on the p value obtained for the test and the level of p value considered st statistically significant ideally the researchers have determined this level of significance before the study in most cases the p value considered statistically significant is less than 0.05 key point when reading a study once you determine a neg if a negative result is truly negative or if there was not enough power to show differences in results and b if a positive result is really positive including whether it's clinically meaningful the power of a study statistical power is the probability that one will find a statistically significant difference in an outcome when a difference really exists most studies use 80 to 90% power when calculating their sample size the greater the power the larger the sample size needed in a study p value a p value is a probability of obtaining an outcome as extreme or more extreme than the observed result assuming the null hypothesis is true if the p value is set less than significance level prior to the study the result is considered statistically significant a p value less than 0.05 means the probability is less than 1 in 20 that a difference that large in a study could be by chance alone key points p values are limitations in the interpretation they do not a indicate the strength or direction of the association b provide a direct interpretation of the results note confidence intervals are more inf informative than p values as they are derived from the study data confidence intervals confidence intervals are computed from the sample data with a specific probability that contains the unknown true population or the target population value within the interval in other words data from the sample population are used to make an inference about the likelihood of an outcome in the target population a 95% confidence interval means that one can state with 95% certainty that the true number or outcome lies within the range given by the confidence interval the key point when looking at a result with a confidence interval the reader must determine what type of analysis was done specifically was the test looking for a difference in outcomes or a risk of an event when the difference between outcomes is assessed any confidence interval that can contain the value 0 would not be considered a statistically significant result in the case of a ratio relative risk or odds ratio or hazards ratio any confidence interval that contains a value 1 would not be considered statistically significant statistical versus clinical significance even if the results of the study are statistically meaningful it does not necessarily mean they are clinically relevant to determine clinical significance one must know what the clinically meaningful difference one should expect to find in a study key point when statistical significance is not observed example when the p value is greater than 0.05 either a the null hypothesis is true and that no difference really exists or b the sample size was not large enough to detect a difference thus an insufficient study power sample size researchers need to know prior to starting a study 
how many people will be needed to achieve a desired result. If the study was a negative result, it may be because the sample size was insufficient. The key point, one must read the entire study, methods and results to see if the numbers of participants who remain in the study still meet the sample size limits when assessing statistical significance. Statistics can be descriptive or inferential. Descriptive statistics or exploratory data analysis is a method of organizing, summarizing and displaying data. It includes calculating measures of central tendency, example mean, along with measures of dispersion, example standard deviation. Graphically displaying data, example histograms, can identify how data are dispersed which subsequently helps determine which types of statistical analysis can be performed. Types of research variables. There are four, more, four main types of research variables. Continuous variable, dichotomous variable, ordinal variable, and nominal variable. Continuous variable is one that does not contain gaps in values. The limits may occur in the precision of the measurement. For example, systolic blood pressure starts at zero at one extreme and can reach over 300 at the other extreme. This measurement of millimeters of mercury is the smallest measurement available that does not contain interruptions in values. Dichotomous variable is a discrete categorical variable with only two possible values. Many studies look at whether or not a patient has an event of interest during the study, example mortality. An ordinal variable is a rank or order. Many survey questions ask respondents to give their opinion based on a predetermined scale from a high ranking number to a low ranking number and often use Likert scales that rank outcomes on a scale from 1 to 5. Given that ordinal scales often have an order that suggests a continuum, many ordinal variables can be considered as continuous outcomes for data analysis if they contain four or more categories. Nominal variable. Nominal variables classify data into named categories. An example would be marital status. There is no rank or order to a nominal variable. In many cases, Researchers collapse nominal variables into two categories so that they can be analyzed using dichotomous statistics. Data distributions. Data distribution can be normal distribution or parametric distribution, or it could be non-normal or non-parametric distribution. The normal distribution is a probability distribution used to describe continuous and some ordinal variables in a population. It is described as a symmetric bell-shaped curve. Non-normal or non-parametric distribution is a probability distribution of continuous or ordinal values that are not symmetric, that's not bell-shaped. Positively skewed data are distributed such that a greater proportion of the observations have values less than or equal to the mean, that is, more observations with lower values. Negatively skewed data are distributed such that the greater proportion of observations have values greater than or equal to the mean, that is, more observations with higher values. Confirmatory data analysis or inferential statistics. Confirmatory data analysis or inferential statistics uses estimation and hypothesis testing to assess the strength of evidence making comparisons, make predictions, and draw conclusions about a population based on sample data. There are two main categories of inferential statistics, bivariate and multivariable analysis. Bivariate analysis investigate relationship between one dependent or outcome and one independent or predictor variable. Bivariate analysis includes a discrete data analysis and continuous data analysis. 
multivariable analysis investigate relationships between one dependent and multiple independent variables while controlling for the possible confounding influence of several independent variables on the dependent variable. The results of inferential statistics are reported according to the type of data collected and the statistical test or method used to determine the result. Bivariate analysis, discrete data analysis, contingency tables show the individual responses to one variable as a function of another variable. Contingency tables are used in calculating relative risks and used in chi-square analysis. Chi-square analysis is a statistical test used to compare two unpaired or independent samples where the outcome is dichotomous or nominal and the sample size is large that is greater than 30. If any cell of the contingency table contains a value of less than 5, Fisher's exact test must be used. The chi-square test itself compares what is observed in the data to what is expected to happen. This analysis starts with the contingency table to display and compare results. You can use chi-square analysis as a a test of independence that is the two factors are independent and not related or a test of no association that is the two groups are similar with respect to some characteristics. Reporting of the chi-square analysis results. Results of the chi-square analyses are reported as proportions that is number and percentage of each group. Fisher's exact test compares two unpaired independent samples where the outcome is dichotomous or nominal and the expected sample size for one category is small that is less than 5. It is the alternative to the chi-square test when results are small. Reports of the Fisher's exact test results are reported as proportions that is the number and percentage in each group. Relative risk. Relative risk assesses if the exposure is associated with the change in the risk of an outcome. It is one of the most commonly reported outcomes in literature. Mathematically, using the contingency table, one can say relative risk equals the proportion responding to the treatment in one group to the proportion responding to a treatment in another group. The interpretation of the relative risk results are as follows. When relative risk is greater than 1, it means the exposure is associated with increased risk. When the relative risk equals 1, means that the exposure is not associated with a change in risk. When the relative risk is less than 1, it means the exposure is associated with a decreased risk or is protected. Reporting of relative risk results. Results of relative risk are reported as a ratio with the confidence interval. Example, relative risk equals 1.5, 95% confidence interval 1.2 to 1.8. The interpretation is there is a 1.5 times greater risk in group 1 compared to group 2. Alternatively, you can say that group 1 has a 50% increased risk compared to group 2. Odds ratio compares the odds of an event happening in one group to the odds of the same event happening in another group. Mathematically, using contingency table, one can say the odds ratio equals the odds of the treatment group 1 having a response divided by the odds of the treatment group 2 having a response. The interpretation of odds ratio are as follows. When the odds ratio is greater than 1.0, it means that the exposure is associated with increased odds. When the odds ratio equals 1.0, it means the exposure is not associated with change in odds. And when the odds ratio is less than 1.0, it means the exposure is associated with decreased odds or is protective. 
Odds ratios are commonly presented in medical literature. Specifically, they are used in multiple logistic regression analysis when the outcome is dichotomous and the researcher wishes to control or adjust for potential confounding factors. More details in the multiple logistic regression description. Reporting of odds ratio re results. Results of odds ratios are reported as a ratio with a confidence interval. Example, odds ratio equals 1.5, 95% confidence interval, 1.2 to 1.8. The interpretation is, there is a 1.5 times greater odds of the event in group 1 compared to group 2. Alternatively, you can say that the group 1 has a 50% increase in odds compared to group 2. Odds ratio as an estimate or relative risk. When the outcome of interest is rare, the relative risk is similar to odds ratio. We can see this in the in contingency tables where when the event of cancer is rare in both the exposure and non-exposure group. When the outcome of interest is not rare, then the relative risk is not equal to the odds ratio. The key point, odds ratios are used in certain regression analysis and the results should be described as an odds ratio or a change in odds and not as a change in risk. Continuous data analysis Continuous outcomes and subordinal measures with multiple categories are analyzed using parametric or non-parametric statistical tests depending on the shape or the distribution of the outcome variable. Thus, researchers should plot a frequency histogram to assess the normality of data. Each parametric statistical test has a corresponding non-parametric counterpart. For example, Comparison between two unpaired or independent groups, the parametric test is student t-test and the non-parametric test is the Wilcoxon rank sum test. When comparing means between two paired de or dependent groups, the parametric test is the paired t-test and the non-parametric test is the Wilcoxon signed rank test. When comparing means between three or more independent groups, the parametric test is the analysis of variance or ANOVA and the non-parametric test is the call wallace test. Parametric statistical tests assume that the distribution of the outcome variable is normal or bell-shaped distribution. These tests are used when evaluating a continuous or ordinal variable that fit a curve with a normal distribution. There are three parametric statistical tests the student t-test, the pair t-test, and ANOVA. The key point, while there is no absolute sample size that one can rely on to definitely use a parametric test, continuous or ordinal variables with a sample size greater than 50 may be considered strongly for parametric tests. A student t-test is a statistical test used to compare two unpaired or independent samples having a normally distributed continuous outcome. Unpaired or independent means that the groups are not related to each other in any way. For example, in a randomized controlled trial where patients are admitted to study to assess the efficacy of a new drug, there is no dependence or pairing of one patient to another. Indeed, these patients are randomly chosen a study and are then randomly assigned to one or another study groups. Note, the student t-test is also known as a t-test or, or an unpaired t-test. Reporting of student t-test results. Results of student t-tests are reported as the mean difference between groups with a standard deviation or standard error. The paired t-test is a statistical test used to compare two paired or dependent samples where the outcomes is continuous and normally distributed. These pairs can be the same individual before or after an intervention or exposure. 
or they can be two different individuals who have a common origin. For example, individuals could be A, twins, that is common genetic origin, B, family members who live together, environmental common origin, and C, matched cases and controls in a case control study, matched by some characteristic. A paired t-test uses the difference between each pair of outcomes in the anal final analysis. Reporting of paired t-test results. These tests are reported as the mean difference between pairs of groups or, or before and after an intervention with a standard deviation or a standard error. ANOVA or the analysis of variance compares the difference and means of a continuous outcome variable with a normal outcome distribution when three or more groups are being compared. Reporting of ANOVA results. Results of ANOVA are reported as mean differences between groups with a standard deviation or standard error. The key point is the p-value given in an ANOVA represents the statistically significant difference between all groups being compared and not individual comparisons between any two groups. Thus the only conclusion one can make from this test is that, that at least one of the groups is different from the rest of the groups being compared. Non-parametric statistical tests. Non-parametric statistical procedures rely on few or no assumptions about the shape or parameters of the population distribution from which the sample was drawn. These tests do not assume that the shape of the distribution is known. Thus, they are more conservative tests. These tests should be used when the outcome has a non-normal distribution or when the sample size is small. The three main non-parametric statistical tests are the Wilcoxon rank sum test, the Wilcoxon signed rank test, and the Kruskal-Wallis test. The Wilcoxon rank sum test this is a non-parametric statistical test, compares two unpaired or independent samples where the outcome of interest is ordinal or continuous and not normally distributed. The Wilcoxon sign rank test, this is a non-parametric statistical test, compares two paired or dependent samples where the outcome of interest is ordinal or continuous with a skewed dis distribution. The Kruskal Wallis test is used to compare differences in a continuous outcome variable when three or more groups are being compared and have a non parametric outcome distribution. The key point is when the Kruskal Wallis test leads to significant results, then at least one of the groups being compared is different from the other groups. The test does not tell us whether the group is different. Reporting of non parametric results. The three non-parametric tests calculate the level of statistical significance based on weighted values and not the actual values observed. Results should be reported by researchers as medians with interquartile ranges. Multivariable regression analysis. Definition of regression. Regression analysis is a statistical method used to describe the association between one dependent variable and one or more independent variables. It is used to adjust or control for confounding variables. It can also be used to predict or estimate the value of one variable based on the values of other variables. The confounding variable or confounding factor is a variable related to one or more of the variables in one in a study. This variable may mask an actual association or falsely demonstrate an apparent association between the study variables where no real association exists. A variable is a confounder if it is related to the predictor variable and the outcome variable and is not in the causal pathway between the two between these two variables. For example, 
when evaluating whether diabetes leads to heart disease. Obesity can cause both diabetes and heart disease, therefore it's a confounding factor. When evaluating whether obesity leads to heart failure, it is not confounding since both diabetes and heart disease lead to heart failure. Mathematics behind regression. Regression analysis is based on the linear mathematical equation y equals mx plus b. When regression analysis is carried out, all variables of interest are analyzed at the same time. The data output from the st statistics package provides the results for each variable of interest or confounder while controlling for other variables. In other words, even if you are only interested in looking at the effect of diabetes and heart disease while controlling for other factors including obesity, age, smoking, gender, etc. The statistical program allows you to see how much each confounder affects the outcome while controlling for other variables. Linear regression. Linear regression analysis is used to quantify the association between one or more independent variables and a continuous outcome that is normally distributed. Depending on the number of factors being compared, one can use a simple linear regression or multiple linear regression. Simple linear regression is a comparison between one independent and one continuous dependent factor or variable. It does not control for potential confounding variables. For example, comparing exercise, an independent variable as it relates to blood pressure which is a continuous dependent variable. Multiple linear regression is a comparison between more than one independent and one continuous dependent factor while controlling or adjusting for poten potential confounding factors. For example, comparing exercise as it relates to blood pressure while controlling for age, weight and smoking status. In order to decide what factors to control for in any type of regression analysis, researchers analyze or control for factors that are A, significant in simple regression or univariate analysis and B, are previously known to confound results and C makes sense as confounders. The key point is only multiple regression controls for confounding factors. Simple regression is used to assess which factors are independently associated with the outcome of interest. Reporting of linear regression results. The outcome for a, for a linear regression analysis is expressed as a B coefficient this coefficient is the expected change in an outcome when the predictor variable changes by one unit and other variables and confounders remain fixed. For example, the mean change in blood pressure decreased by 5 mm of mercury in the exercise group compared to the no exercise group after controlling for A, gender and other medications. Logistic regression Logistic regression analysis is used to quantify the association between one or more independent variables and a dichotomous outcome. Depending on the number of factors being compared, one can use a simple logistic regression or multiple linear regression. Simple logistic regression is a comparison between one independent and one dichotomous variable or, out or outcome. For example, comparing exercise which is an independent variable as it relates to mortality which is a dichotomous dependent variable. Multiple logistic regression is a comparison between more than one independent and one dichotomous independent factor while controlling for potential confounding factors. For example, comparing exercise as it relates to mortality while taking into consideration age, weight and smoking status. Reporting of logistic regression analysis. Logistic regression results are reported as an odds ratio with a confidence interval. For example, the odds ratio of mortality for subjects who exercised compared to those who did not exercise was 0.35. That is 95% confidence interval between 0.1 to 0.4. This can also be stated as Subjects who exercised had a 65% decrease odds of mortality compared to those who did not 
exercise. Survival analysis. Survival analysis is a method of comparing the time it takes for an event to occur. We often assess time to mortality in medicine, but the endpoint can be any factor, such as time to an adverse event. There are two types of survival analysis, Kaplan-Myers analysis and the Cox proportional hazards regression. The Kaplan-Myer analysis is a graphical way of estimating the survival of a cohort over time or to assess the time to an event. Kaplan-Meier only looks at the differences in outcomes over the entire length of the study and reports a p-value using a log rank test. The interpretation of this analysis is that the groups did or did not differ throughout the time of the study. This analysis does not control for confounding factors. The key point, Kaplan-Meier analysis does not test the difference between the groups at any specific time point. It can only tell you that if one or more groups differ throughout the time period assessed. The Cox proportional hazard regression analysis assesses time to a dichotomous outcome where the independent variables are nominal or continuous. This analysis controls for confounding factors. Reporting of Cox proportional hazard regression results Results are reported using a hazards ratio. The hazards ratio is interpreted like a relative risk in that it is the relative risk of an event when comparing to the exposed group to the unexposed group. A hazards ratio of one greater than 1.0 means the exposure is associated with the increased risk. When the hazards ratio equals 1.0 means that the exposure is not associated with change in risk. And when the hazard ratio is less than 1.0, means the exposure is associated with decreased risk or is protective. Study design. The study design dictates how data are evaluated and subsequently interpreted. There are two main study types, observational studies and experimental studies. Observational studies. These studies observe a group or groups at one or more points in time with, without an intervention. There are three types of observational studies. Prospective cohort or longitudinal studies. Case control studies and a cross-sectional study. Prospective cohort or longitudinal study follows a group or groups over time to see if an event occurs. The study design is also called a longitudinal study. For example, one would follow a group of smokers and non-smokers for two years and look for lung cancer incidence. Case control study. A case control study compares those with an outcome and those without an outcome and looks at risk factors that may have contributed to the outcome. For example, you can find patients with lung cancer and a group of patients without lung cancer matched by age and determine the risk factors including smoking history. Cross-sectional study. A cross-sectional study takes a random sample of individuals at one period of time and classifies them according to the presence or absence of the exposures and the outcome of interest. For example, one can survey individuals from a specific geographic location and determine the presence of lung cancer and it says risk factors for lung cancer, including smoking. Experimental studies. Experimental studies allocate interventions to one or more groups and make comparisons. There are three types of experimental studies, pre-post studies, control trials, and randomized control trials. Pre-post study assess a characteristic of interest before and after an intervention and see if changes have occurred. For example, one can provide smokers with a medication to help them quit smoking and after a designated time period to see if it was successful. The control trial or randomized control trial. In a control trial, both groups are treated equally except the control group does not receive the intervention. The course of both groups is followed for outcomes of interest. The gold standard is the randomized control trial. 
In the randomized control trial, the intervention assignment is done in a random and often blinded fashion. Blinding is an attempt to make participants and or researchers in a study unaware of which intervention is given to which participants so that this knowledge does not influence their actions in the study. A double blind study provides blinding of both participants and researchers. Systematic reviews and meta-analysis. The goals of a systematic review are to apply explicit scientific principles to answer a research question based on an exhaustive summary of the literature, published and unpublished. They often, but not always, use statistical techniques such as meta-analysis to combine results. The benefits of systematic reviews, one, integrate existing information and thus provide increased power and precision or effect size. Two, establish whether findings are consistent or can be generalized. Three, usually quicker and less costly than new studies. Four, assess the consistency of relationships, including direction and magnitude, given the variability in study protocols. Five, explain data inconsistencies and conflicts. And six, reduce random and systematic errors that is bias of single studies. A meta-analysis is a statistical technique that combines results of two studies or more in order to improve the reliability of the individual study results. Combined studies may be sufficiently similar in order to accurately combine results. Greater weight is given to results from larger studies as they provide more information. When the treatment effect is consistent across studies, Meta-analysis can be used to identify this common effect. When the effect varies from across studies, meta-analysis can be used to identify the reason for the variation. Meta-analysis outcomes are reported in a forest plot. In this plot, each study is listed along with the point estimate and the confidence interval of that study result in a line through the box. The smaller the box of the point estimate and the narrower the, the confidence interval, the stronger the study's result. The overall effect is shown as a diamond. The diamond is on the significance line, that is 1 for ratios or 0 for difference in outcomes. The combined result for all the studies is not statistically significant. Advantages of meta-analysis 1. Statistical testing of overall factors and effect size 2. Generalized results to the overall population of studies 3. Control for between study variation and 4. Higher statistical power to detect an effect than in a single study Weaknesses of the meta-analysis 1. Does not control for source of bias b. A good meta-analysis of a badly designed study will still result in bad statistical results. 3. Heavy reliance on published studies which may create exaggerated outcomes. And 4. Dangers of an agenda-driven bias. Summary points. 1. When a study is not specifically powered to look for ordinary outcomes, the strength of the evidence may not be sufficient to make conclusions about these outcomes. 2. When reading a study, one should determine if a negative result is truly negative or if there was not enough power to show differences in results. And a positive result is really positive, including whether it is clinical, clini clinically meaningful. 3. P-values have limitations in their interpretation. They do not indicate the strength or direction of the association. They do not provide a direct interpretation of the results. 4. Confidence intervals are more informative than p-values as they are derived from study data. When looking at a result with a confidence interval, the reader must determine what type of analysis was done. Specifically, was the test looking for a difference in outcomes or a risk of an event? When the difference between outcomes is assessed, 
any confidence interval that contains the value 0 would not be considered statistically significant result. In the case of a ratio such as relative risk, odds ratio or hazards ratio, any confidence interval that contains the value of 1 would not be considered statistically significant. 5. When statistical significance is not observed, that is the p-value is greater than 0 0.05, either the null hypothesis is true, that is there is no difference really exists, or the sample size was not large enough to detect a difference, thus an insufficient study power. 6. One must read the entire study, including methods and results, to see if the numbers of participants who remain in the study still meet the sample size limits when assessing statistical significance. 7. The p-value given in an analysis of variance ANOVA represents the statistically significant difference between all groups being compared and not individual comparisons between any two groups. Thus, the only conclusion one can make from this test is that at at least one of the groups is different from the rest of the groups being compared. 8. Non-parametric tests are statistically less powerful than parametric tests. Thus, they are less likely to show a statistically significant difference when one exists. Non-parametric tests are often used, often use rankings when reporting results and not actual data. 9. Odds ratios are used in regression analysis and the results should be described as an odds ratio or a change in odds and not as a change in risk. 10. While there is no absolute sample size one can rely on to definitely use a parametric test, continuous or ordinal outcomes with sample size greater than 50 may be considered strongly for parametric, parametric tests. 11. When Kruskal Wallace test leads to significant results, then at least one of the groups being compared is different from the other groups. The test does not tell us which group is different. 12. Only multiple regression controls for confounding factors. Simple regression is used to assess which factors are independently associated with the outcomes of interest. And finally, kaplan meier analysis does not test the difference between groups at any specific time point. It can only tell you if one or more groups differ throughout the time period assessed. For more information on how to choose and interpret statistical tests, see the article by Dr. Windish and Dr. Diener West. The article is titled A Clinical Educator's Roadmap to Choosing and, and Interpreting Statistical Tests, published in the Journal of General Internal Medicine, 2006, Volume 21, pages 656 to 660. This podcast is derived from an outstanding chapter in Baliga's textbook of internal medicine available at www.mastermedfacts.com. It is derived from the chapter titled Statistics in Medicine, authored by Dr. Donna Windish, MD, who is Associate Professor at Yale University School of Medicine.